breaks the tackle, dust along the right, put the champion foot forward, what a goal! Jason, welcome to Open Mic. Thank you, Mike. Thank you. You did tell me I should be a little bit nervous. I hadn't even thought about it. I'm actually a little intimidated now. Oh, of course you are. <laughs> Great pleasure to be granted an audience with the man named number five on the all-time best player list in the AFL. The only problem was that you were the one that named me number five. <laughs> I forgot that bit. <laughs> um, seriously, though, it seems that greatness sits uneasily with you. I mean, you, you, uh, you're always into the future. Your recollection about the past is sketchy. Does it, are you a bit embarrassed about how good you were? No, I, I never quite thought it like that. Thought about it like that. Um, I don't remember great specifics of the past. Um, that's, that's fair to say. Maybe I copped a couple too many knocks to the head. I'm not <laughs> sure. Um, but I, I had a fantastic time playing, and I'm thrilled with what I achieved as part of a great team. But I wouldn't say it. I, I, I never think about being a great player or that it sits easily or uneasily with me. It's just, just the way it is. Okay. It's been an interesting 12 years since you retired. You're the most influential man at Hawthorne as the director of football. <laughs> According to you again. <laughs> you're the face of Fox Sports. You're the head man of Triple M. Oh. <laughs> and you're often seen on the golf course and the tennis court. Now, you've fashioned a very, very interesting life for yourself. Uh, very enjoyable. Um, you know, after spending 14 years at a footy club, the, the game is such an important part of your life. It's uh, a wonderful privilege to be able to actually continue in the same vein and do something associated with the game as a, as a means of going forward. And, you know, as you say, I've had 12 fantastic years staying involved in the game. You do love footy? You love it in the pure sense? I'm passionately about it, absolutely. Um, I love watching the game and, and it's funny, you do three or four games a weekend at times and halfway through the season you start thinking, gee, I'm a little bit sick of the footy and you see a few ordinary games, but every time you see a great one, it just brings you back to saying this is a fantastic game. And then as the season gets to the stage it does now, you get excited about the finals rolling around. Do you enjoy the modern game? I love it. You absolutely do? love it. It's brilliant to watch. I get a little concerned when the the rules officials start <laughs> suggesting they want to tinker with the game uh, a little more and, you know, capping interchanges and goals rebounding off the post and going through and those sorts of things tend to raise my eyebrows a little bit, Mike. But I, look, I think uh, the people in charge have done a good job bringing the game to the point that it is now. I think it's a, it's a great time just to let it settle and let's enjoy the game. Lots of people say that it's not the game it was because of the physicality. They've turned it into netball or basketball and sanitised it. It's still pretty tough, isn't it? Yeah, you speak to the current day players and uh, they wouldn't have a clue what you're talking about because they go hell for leather. They bang heads, they, they smash into each other. It is a taxing game. You only have to see the, uh, the amount of time they spend on the training track. You look what they do pre-season and then what they do during the course of a week to get themselves up for a game. It is incredibly taxing on the players. Maybe there's no behind the, uh, the ball incidents like there used to be. Um, that was a fear playing back in the old days when tough blokes or, uh, or mean blokes just decided there was one way to fix things and that was to give you one, you know, back of the head, side mm -hmm. of the jaw, whatever. That doesn't happen anymore. But that doesn't mean it's any less tough. Hawthorne recruited you from Queensland where you played with Cooperoo. Yes. What was your Australian football background? Started playing when I was five in the under sevens at Cooperoo. And then played under sevens, under nines, elevens, thirteens, fifteens. Didn't play seventeens for some reason. I think um, school might have gotten in the way of that. And then played nineteens and, and seniors. So uh, the way I got into it, my father was a rugby union man. Played rugby union at uh, private school in Brisbane, and he would have loved me to have played rugby union. wasn't uh, um, wasn't overly thrilled when I gave it away, but. Uh, when I was five, the only game you were allowed to play as a five-year-old was Australian Rules. Too, too young to play rugby, league or union. So they took me down to Cooper and I was just having a run around there. So I'd play Australian Rules for the, for the club and, and rugby union for the school as, uh, as I went through school. Obviously, you know, from under 13s onwards or whatever. Would have been a big culture shock, Jason, coming from Queensland and to the sort of the madhouse of Melbourne with its football. What are your recollections of that time? Oh, massive culture shock. Absolutely massive. I was like a, a deer in the headlights when I came down. Um, Queensland was so laid back compared to Melbourne and the, the importance that the footy culture plays in people's lives in Victoria was extraordinary. I mean, people's working week depends on how their team goes on the weekend or a lot of it did for some people and, and I'd never experienced anything as um, as intense as that so that took a lot to adapt to um, and I I grew up as a kid barracking for Carlton I used to love Carlton we played in the same jumpers at Cooper I used to idolize blokes like Bruce Dool and Wayne Harms and the Dominator and all these sort of guys my heroes 
Learned to hate Carlton pretty quickly when I got down here though. But the, the cold winters, I mean, I'd never experienced anything like it. But it was also a, a wonderful experience, like going to the Big, the Big Apple, you know? It was, um, it, it had everything Melbourne. And, uh, and I was just, a, I guess, even though I was 19, 20 when I came down, still probably immature in, in terms of being in the big city. And, and it was just uh, an eye-opening experience, I guess, every week. I remember interviewing you late in your career, and my recollection is that you said Darren Jarman was the best player that you played with. The best player I've ever played with on his day. His day didn't happen as often as some of the most consistent players we've seen play the game, some of the great ones, but on his day, he was the most magical player I'd ever seen because I could, I played with the guy for years and I didn't know if he was a left or a right footer. It made no <laughs> difference. <laughs> He'd kick it 50 across his body on either foot and you wouldn't break stride. He didn't look quick, yet he could dance out of four or five players and make them look like they're standing still. He could take the big mark. He never fumbled the ball. He could pick it up at ground level. He, he was a genius. When you gave Jars that accolade, I remember it caused a lot of discussion in the footy community. Where did that leave you with Dermot, Dipper, and even the great Lee Matthews? Oh, look, it, people think that because I said he's the best player I've seen on his day, that he's the best player I've played with. That's not, they're two different things, if that makes sense. I mean, I played with guys like um, Gary Ayres and Michael Tuck and Chris Langford, um, Dermot, Dipper, Johnny Platten was a superstar. I mean, a little bloke that just relentlessly ran all day in the later years, played with uh, Shane Crawford. Great players. All I'm talking about was a bloke that on his day was the best that I'd seen. Okay, over the journey, who was the best Hawthorne player that you played with? I only played one year with Lee Matthews, so it's unfair to judge. I mean, he's regarded as arguably the best that's ever played the game. And I saw him on TV. He was winding down as I was just coming into it. So. You know, whilst it'd be easy to say Lee Matthews is the greatest I've ever played with, I never saw him at his best. It's too hard to narrow down. I, I played at a fantastic club that had a pretty much. I played on a modern uh, back then. We were like a modern day Geelong, just stars all over the ground. Uh, Dermot, you played a lot of football with Dermot. Yep. You were ex um, outstanding combination as key forwards. Uh, why did you two fall out? <laughs> I love That's this. That's a serious this, question. I understand it's a serious question, and most people believe that to be the case. And it's just, you know what, there's a lot of role playing in the media and this is all that's happened. We've got, there's two very big healthy egos there, Dermot <laughs> and myself. And look, we, we got on brilliantly on field and we we're again part of that successful team. Um, I played longer than he did. His body probably gave up and he had to drop out a little bit earlier and then um, Look, we've had this friendly banter on and off and it's just grown and grown and grown. And it, it's, it's exactly the same as when I worked on the footy show with Sam Newman. The question I got asked for 10 years after I left the footy show was, how do you and Sam Newman get on? We're great mates, but you role play on the show. Uh, I've got to say I don't believe you about that. I okay, think, I so think you're calling me a liar? No, I just say I don't believe you. I think there's a, there's a clear level of animosity between no, there's no, anim and there's no animosity whatsoever. There's a lot of one-upmanship. Um, and I've always loved sledging, Mike. Always loved to <laughs> mingle blokes and, and give it to And Dermot's exactly the same. And I just think we, uh, we love to get one up on each other. There's, no, there's absolutely no animosity there whatsoever. If you uh, assembled a group of eight or ten blokes to go away on a golfing weekend, would Dermot be one of them? No, absolutely not. <clears throat> a, he doesn't like golf. But B, he's not in the group that I hang with. Mm. And, and that's the other thing from footy clubs. There are cliques within footy clubs and you, you get on better with some players than others. Um, Dermot was always a little bit removed because he was such a, a visible superstar. I mean, he, he lived the, the typical rock star life, driving the Ferraris. He had the model girlfriends. He had the Harley Davidson. He had the coloured boots, the, the bright bleached hair, the big diamond earring. This is back when very little of that actually happened. So he was, he was a rock star playing football. OK. Now, you know... Still I've got don't a, believe me, do you? Uh, no. <laughs> you know I've got a thing about conflict of interest in this business. How do you rationalise your roles as a commentator, a very yep. prominent media performer, and the man in charge of the football department at Hawthorne. I can't do anything about that conflict, first and foremost. Do you, and do you, sorry, do you uh, acknowledge that a conflict exists? In most people's eyes, yes. And, and having said that, a large proportion of the people that work in the media have conflicts. Um, it's how you manage that conflict, I think. I, I don't think I've ever favoured Hawthorne in any of the work that I've done in the media. In fact, I've I've been criticised for being too hard on Hawthorne when I've called Hawthorne games. I mean, you can never win because people see things differently. But I always try to call it as I see it. Um, I would do anything for the footy club. I'm still involved. Um, 
because, as I said, it was such a big part of my life, I'd give anything back to that club that they needed me to do, and I, and I will continue to do so. But I also need to make a living, Mike, and the job that I enjoy doing the most is working in the media and, uh, and following the game. Now, sometimes I'm going to call Hawthorne games. So be it. I don't think it's, it's an unmanageable conflict. Geoffrey Kennett, Jason. I remember alerting you recently to the chairman's outburst at the coach. Which I didn't know you, about. You didn't know about it and you had a look that would have killed. A you look were, that would have killed? Yeah, you were extremely... That's probably just from seeing you early in the week, Mark. <laughs> you were extremely angry that the president had gone public with his uh, comments. No, I wasn't. No, I wasn't. You I, We've had this discussion a lot of times. Jeff is Jeff and will always be Jeff. Um, it's the way he was when he was Premier of Victoria. He has a, a unique style. He's been very good for the footy club. He comes warts and all. Would I do it the way he does it? Absolutely not. In fact, most people wouldn't. But he believes in this inalienable right to communicate to the members and to be brutally honest with them. Did you counsel him after the uh, oh, criticism look, of Clark? We've had discussions over the years about how he does things, how I would do things, how I think perhaps um, it's best for the footy club. But it doesn't mean that I'm right. It doesn't mean that he's wrong. 2009, Jason. At the end of the uh, 08, the Hawthorne had won a flag. Lots of us were thinking they'd built the platform for a, a dynasty almost. 2009, you missed the finals. Yeah. Were there, is there a genuine explanation for that or did they just get ahead of themselves? I don't think they got ahead of themselves at all. I, look, and, and maybe my opinion's different to other people's. I thought, um, look, Geelong clearly the best side in 2008, but we're the best side in September. And I think we introduced a, a style of play that, that Alistair Clarkson brought to the club and worked on for three or four years that won us a premiership. I thought, I thought the coaching was equally um, responsible for the premiership, as was the playing group. But what happened was all the opposition sides started to work out how to combat the zone, how to manipulate the zone, and the games progressed enormously from a couple of years ago. So all of a sudden we had to go from playing largely uncontested footy back to contested footy. And I think we found out, and this is, this is a pretty brutal assessment of our list as well, that we had a number of blokes that weren't that comfortable winning contested <laughs> footy. And we've had to educate them to get back to winning contested footy, and I think that's taken the best part of 18 months. You, and I think it's fair to say, your fingerprints are all over that Premiership win in terms of assembling the coaching group and, and, and maybe even the player group. I don't like the way you phrase that. Uh, yes, I was very responsible for getting Alistair Clarks into the club, but that was my job at the time. I don't like saying my fingerprints are over the Premiership. That's the coaching staff and the playing group. The football department worked enormously hard for four years. That's their Premiership, mate. Well, I hadn't actually asked the question, Jase. Okay. Thanks I'm for the answer. I was going to say, uh, compare the, the sense of uh, <laughs> pride and satisfaction that yep. you got out of that with the Premierships that you played, and you played in four as a player. Yeah. I know they're different, I understand that, but you must have extracted a lot of pride from the uh, 2008 success. Absolutely. Uh, uh, you're right, a very different feeling. But I was, I was over the moon. I was so chuffed inside, sitting in the southern stand, watching the 2008 grand final. Almost a surreal feeling, thinking this can't be happening. We're actually going to win this, you know. Um, and I guess the most special moment for me, and, and I'll, I'll forever remember this day, because I had family and friends down from interstate. So I was just having a barbecue at my place that night rather than attending the club function and, and all those sorts of things. And we were sitting there after it all, um, quietened down and we'd all enjoyed the game and it was fantastic and we we're thrilled. We we're back at my place having a, a barbecue, having a cold beer and at about, oh, I don't know, it must have been 7.30, um, coming down the hallway was Alistair Clarkson, and Ian Robson and Mark Evans with the Premiership Cup. And that to me was just such a special moment to share that I just hugged Clark and I said, oh mate, how good was this? It was brilliant. They just stopped in on the way to the official function and I'm uh, very, very grateful for that. After the break, Dunstall talks about why he was such a good kick for goal and the period when he wore the game's worst ever headwear. That's a magnificent snap goal. You kicked 1,260 goals in your career. 54, mate. Don't credit me with six I didn't kick, please. What was your kicking routine? Uh, I developed it from, uh, I guess, from the early days. I didn't have much of a routine at all. I just used to try and kick the cover off the footy. And, 
And early on, because I was playing in a team that was so dominant, the ball kept coming down so much, I didn't perhaps value or understand um, the value of missing shots for goal. And I thought, oh, it'll be back down in a moment and I'll make up for it and get the next one that comes down. But as you get older and you get to the latter stages of the career and the ball's not coming down as frequently and you're not as good and you're not getting as much of it, you think, I've got to make every kick count. So my kicking, I think, in the back half of my career was much better than in the, in the, the front half. But that's, that's something you get from countless hours of repetition on the training track. So it is that. It's purely the practice. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And did you, did you have a routine? Did you have a, a certain number of steps? Or? I didn't count steps. Um, a couple of basic principles, obviously. I tried to keep things, if you could imagine, uh, a lane on a running track was my run-up. I, I couldn't go out of that in any way, shape or form. And also with the follow through of the leg. Everything had to be in line with the target. Now, if there's a breeze blowing, that lane, you adjust it to however far you need to adjust it from the centre of the goals to allow for the breeze. But I mean, essentially, it's the same kick every time you go, and it should. I didn't stab at the ball; I kicked through it all, all the time. Um, and then it was just trying to make sure that the drop of the footy was as good as I could make it. I didn't have a great style; I dropped the ball from pretty high, so I had to work hard at it. The target? Did you pick a target in the crowd or no, an no, upright? Centre, no, centre of the goals for me. Okay, and just try to lob it over the goal umpire's head. No, or? just kick through the footy from however far out you were and get the job done. Have you ever bothered to try to help Buddy and? Joe Ruffhead with their kicking? It's a fallacy, this. It's a fallacy that people think that because you've done something so well, you can make others do it just as well. Uh, I spent time uh, working with the guys on goal kicking two or three years ago, maybe four years ago. Um, did a few sessions with them and, and happy to do it. But we've now got so many full-time staff at the footy club whose job it is to do that. They don't need me poking my head in once a week and doing something like that. You need a consistent message. But the difference is also they don't have the time to practice the way we used to because we trained part time when I first started out so you could spend extra hours doing it. They're at the club all day every day. Now they do have goal kicking sessions, they have a number of goal kicking sessions and they've got people working on it, they review the videos all the time, they look at the things they're doing right, they look at the things they're doing wrong. It's going to take time and practice. Franklin's a unique case. Buddy's a uh, He's unfixable. He, he's that <laughs> far away from what you would say is a textbook way of kicking for goal that we, we look, we tried a couple of times to, to put poles down and have him run in a straight line and kick it. He nearly fell over. Mm -hmm. he can't do it. And then he nearly missed the ball at the end because it felt so uncomfortable for him. He'd, he'd, he'd kick the posts, you know. His <laughs> hand had hit it as he took the ball from out here. So you've got to allow him, I think, to, to kick the way he's going to kick and accept the fact that he's probably going to be marginally better than a 50-50 chance. So when you see Jared Ruffhead take two, three steps on his approach and then lean back and you say to yourself, I've seen this a hundred times before, do you not feel the inclination to sort of either say to Clarko or to Ruffy, change it? Just it's not. No, I, sp I speak to the guys that are actually working with him. There's no doubt about it. Length of the run-up doesn't bother me. When he leans back, that's one of his problems. That's one of his, and that's where he misses to the left all the time when he leans back. Jared Ruffhead is an exceptional kick when you watch him on the training track, and and I've watched him in pre-game warm-ups where he's just slotted goal after goal. But it's a mental battle for him. It's getting that confidence of being able to do it and expecting to being able to do it in match situations that hasn't come from yet. But I have no doubt that whether it's 12 months or 24 months down the track, he'll develop into a very good kick for goal. Now, look up now. No, it's fine. Stay there. Stay there. You and your old sparring partner, Danny Frawley, are involved with yesterday's heroes on the very, very popular Before the Bounce. It's nice to see you having a bit of fun. There's a perception about you of being a grump. I mean, yeah. is that fair? Again, this comes from the role playing that I was speaking about uh, you know, from the footy show in the early days. I was the grumpy one that would always take on Sam. I'm very good at playing a grump, Mike, mind you. <laughs> but I think we know each other well enough and you've seen me in other circumstances. And I'm a pretty happy-go-lucky person that loves to have fun uh, away from things as well. I mean, I've got to be serious when the time's right to be serious, whether it's uh, on camera or, or working in my role at the footy club. But I love having fun as much as the next bloke does. And, and I think we've found the right vehicle for Spud and I to completely embarrass ourselves, much to our own delight, on a regular basis on Before the Bounce. How's the week been? Oh, it's been fantastic. What was your view of Spud when uh, he was your regular opponent when you played the Saints? He was a hard man, Spud. He, uh, he loved to punch on. I mean, that was back in the days where if you took a mark and they couldn't spoil it, they'd punch the back of your mm. head. And, and Spud would do that as well as anyone. Spud was a fierce competitor. He's a bloke that got the most out of him. And we had some great battles. 
But the great thing about working with people that you thought were like that, Glenn Jakovic is another. Uh, I'll get on him in a moment, but Spud and I have become great mates and we love what we're doing. Glenn Jakovic, I used to think, was the most serious bloke with no mm. personality when he played. And I admired him as a footballer because that was back when we had a, a fantastic rivalry with the West Coast as well. But having worked with him now, he's a ripper jacker. I love going out and having a beer with him after we've done a game interstate. We have a ball just having a chat and having a laugh. I couldn't could never grasp how different he was, mm. you know, mm. now off the field after footy's over to the way I perceived him when he played. It bounces in the, oh, in the vicinity of Kerry. In oh. the vicinity. Magnificent. You worked with a lot of famous names. I reckon your rapport with Wayne Carey on Saturday Central was as good as I've seen. I mean, there's clearly a mutual respect between mm. you and the Duck. He always got on great. Always got on really well. And I think there was that respect. No doubt about that. And uh, I... He's the guy that I will always say was the best footballer I've seen, period. Consistency, skill, ability to impact a game throughout his entire career, he was peerless. Both you and Duck have expressed reservations publicly about the tactics of Stephen Silvani, who was a regular opponent for both of you. Did he play within the rules or did he break them? Let's clarify that. He got away with whatever he could get away with and was entitled to as every fullback was back in that era. These days, we just we laugh because these days you can't do half the things that you used to be able to do back then. And the reason we probably moan about it is because he was so bloody good sauce mm. and he was so hard to beat. I never kicked a huge bag on him and it annoyed and frustrated <laughs> the hell out of me mm. because you'd think you'd have him beaten and he'd find a way to get that arm in. But the thing that Duck and I laugh about with sauce, and, uh, and I get in great with sauce when I see him. Um, there's no dramas here, there's a fantastic respect there as well. But if you actually did beat him in a contest, he then wins the umpire saying, oh, he pushed me or he grabbed me. And we'd sit there and go, are you kidding me? You just can't be like that. But, but, you know, he played it well. He worked the umpires well. He knew what he could get away with and he was uh, incredibly hard to beat. Lots of superstars at Hawthorne in your day, Jason, and several players who were underrated by, I think, in the broader community. Players like Langford, Mew, Ayres, Pritchard, those sort of guys. Yeah, look, I, I think most of them got the, the respect they deserved. I reckon Chris Mew was a vastly underrated player. Mewy never said boo, you never saw him after game, straight back to Rosebud with the family, very quiet sort of guy, but unbelievable player. I mean, he played against the best centre half forwards in the game, and I can't remember him getting toweled up on any day. And he had this ability to, to mark the ball with his head not looking at it. Oh, it was, it was exceptional. But he was a bloke that just went out and got the job done week in, week out, that I don't think perhaps people realised just how good he was. I mean, the other names you mentioned, all brilliant players, brilliant players. But I think people perhaps were more readily aware of them than they were of someone like a Chris Mew. You played with the worst item of headgear that we've seen in world sports since Tony Gregg's days with World Series cricket. How, were you embarrassed running around with that? Uh, well, I, I don't was? understand why I should be embarrassed. Here's me thinking I'm making a gutsy effort to get back <laughs> on the playing field because I was only allowed to play um, by the surgeon if I wore this helmet that he specifically designed to cover the fractured skull that I had. And all I did was get ridicule and, uh, and laughter from all and sundry. And I thought, oh, gee, no pity here, is there? Uh, and look, it's become very much a, uh, a running joke for blokes ever since. At the, at the time, I was just keen to play. I'm very, very nervous getting back into it. Tell but, me, you, you've tell, so there's the fractured skull that occurred against Melbourne. How long be, before you played after the accident? Okay, depressed fracture of the skull just uh, here above the eye. Um, there's, there's two layers of bone. I only broke the first one. If you break both of them, you're in all sorts of trouble. So very lucky there. So I had a, a plate and screws put in there where they cut you across the top of the head. They pull your face down, put it all in, then staple you back up. <clears throat> so I was in hospital for a week or so. And I reckon it was, I missed seven games and then came back and was only allowed to play uh, with a helmet if I was to come back, which was designed to come low over the forehead and, and give a little bit of extra protection to that particular area. Um, and it wasn't until I probably got a couple of wax to the head that I actually felt comfortable mm. and, and confident again that it was all okay. In 1992 you kicked 145 goals at an average of 6.3 a game. Finished second in the Brownlows. Surely that was your best year as an in, in an individual sense, was it? Yeah, it was. The disappointing thing I guess that year was I also kicked, I think, 83 points. So if I had been a little bit more accurate, um, you know, I could have kicked 150 plus, which would have been nice. Not that I'm interested in records, but it's just disappointing to kick that many points. But that shows you how much ball was coming down and the fact that I did get a lot of the footy. So from an individual perspective, it certainly wasn't our best team year, but individually my best year, yeah. You talked about uh, records, and I understand, I know that you, they're not important to you, but you kicked 17 goals against Richmond at Waverley Park in um, 
in 92. Now, my recollection is you almost seem to run away from the opportunity to get the shot to kick the 18th and equal the record. Is that, is that a no, fair... No, no. Well, uh, look, um, people will probably say, oh, you, you bull, uh, you're, you're telling lies. I didn't even know what the record was. Because, again, I didn't grow up with the game. So I wasn't aware of what all the records in place were. And I think the scoreboard started flashing up when I kicked 16 that it was a Waverley Park record. And then um, 17 was a Hawthorne record. Didn't know about the other, although a couple of teammates then came and told me, got to get another one. But I also, for whatever reason, call me mad, but didn't change the way I played the game. So when my opponent ran up the ground, I ran up with him. And this was late in the game. And I'd had a pretty big game, Mike. I'd had 29 <laughs> possessions. I was tired. I didn't have a lot of energy in the tank at the, at, you know, at the best of times. I was knackered. I reckon I walked back to position the last couple of minutes and, uh, and perhaps missed an opportunity to kick 18. But, you know, that was just a fantastic day for me where everything went right. And uh, I've got great memories of it. Would you have liked to share the record, retrospectively? Oh, in hindsight, yeah, it'd be great. But I'll kick 17-5. Mm. And, and it was funny. Um, uh, Fred Fanning's record, isn't it? Yep. When did it, what, what year did he pass uh, away? Uh, oh, six or eight years ago, I reckon. Yeah. I reckon I spoke to him some stage, you know, after that, but before he passed away, and he said, gee, if you weren't so inaccurate, you would have had the record. Because <laughs> he kicked 18-1, I think it was. That's right. I'm thinking 17-5 is very accurate over the journey. I mean, you're kicking more than three goals for every point which would be a brilliant conversion rate over your career, but he called it inaccurate. I thought, she thought it was okay. Buddy would have been 11-11. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jason, really enjoyed the chat. Great travelling down memory lane with you. Always a pleasure, mate. Cheers. This has been a Fox Sports production.